Are these working? Or do we want to see if these are working? Hi. Are these supposed to be working? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Linda Lees. I'm head of programming for TAFAF New York. Welcome to some sunshine this morning. Happy to have you and it. Uh, I want to give you just a word of introduction about TAFAF Coffee Talks and what we've been trying to do with this series. We did it, we started in the fall. And uh, we're doing it again this spring. The intention is uh, something I borrowed from the Edinburgh Book Festival to give people an opportunity first thing in the morning, knowing that every morning at the same time, in our case, 1030, you can come to this space uh, to hear a fantastic panel talk about subjects we believe are worthy of your time and attention, some of which are current, some of which are just provocations. No, not just provocations, but th that both inform and engage you and uh, keep you thinking once you leave this room. I'm happy to introduce our, our moderator, Frances Beattie, who is president of Adler Beattie, and she will take it from there. Thank you. Oh, I was wondering where. Okay, good. Good morning. I'm going to first introduce our panel, and this is the only thing I'm going to read, so don't get worried. Um, Emmanuel Dodona is a leading expert on surrealist, modern, post 
uh, war art. He's the founder of the Dodona Galleries on Madison Avenue, and prior to forming his own gallery, he spent 17 years at Sotheby's as vice chairman of Impressionist and Modern Art. He holds master's degree in fine art from London's Courtauld Institute. And he's got a fabulous stand upstairs called the Surrealist Banquet. And he has been a champion of surrealism, um, hosting a number of very important shows with very good um, scholarly catalogs in his gallery. So he is really one of the most important dealers in America now uh, in the area of surrealism. Um, uh, Francis Nauman is an independent scholar, curator, and gallery owner. If you're interested in Dada and surrealism, you don't know Francis, then you've been on the moon. Uh, <clears throat> um, he's the author of so many articles on uh, New York Dada, Marcel Duchamp, uh, Age of Mechanical Reproduction. He organized the magisterial show called Making Mischief Dada Invades New York at the Whitney Museum in 97. Um, his most recent book, Recurring Haunting Ghost Essays on the Art, Life, and Legacy of Marcel uh, Duchamp is a huge and fascinating tome. He operates a gallery in New York City, and as I say, he's one of the great specialists of our time in Dada and Surrealism. Um, David Lieber is a partner at David Swerner, which has two galleries, I'm sure you're all aware, in um, Chelsea. Uh, and will be opening in Hong Kong and um, one in London. Um, and most importantly, he's sharing a space with the new B.D. Adler on 69th Street. Um, uh, he began his career at Holly Solomon, uh, pointing out a great connection between pop and surrealism. Let's put a pin in that. And he was at Speroni Westwater for 25 years. And he joined David Zwerner in 2014. He was instrumental in bringing the uh, Joseph and Annie Albers Foundation to the gallery, uh, and he works with um, the, and currently the booth, Zwerner's booth, has wonderful works by Annie and Joseph Albers, and they are paired with Ruth Asawa, who I think we can um, give a nod to biomorphic sculpture and sources in, in surrealism. He's an expert in post-war European art, with a focus on Italy in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, as well as the Zero Group. He did a wonderful Mirandi show at Zwerner, and I'm sure you know of his uh, accomplishments. Charlie Stuckey is um, a brilliant scholar, which anybody who knows anything about art history from Impressionism to modern has read his work over the last 30 years. Um, he's working on the revised catalog resume of Tongi, and he works closely with McCain, McLean Gallery, um, which he has done for 10 years. He was a curator at the National Gallery of Art, the Art Institute of Chicago, Minneapolis, and the Kimball, and he organized exhibitions on Manet, Toulouse Lautrec, Bert Morisot, Gauguin, Monet, and he's published on Rauschenberg, Pollock, Dali, Duchamp. He was awarded a knighthood in the Legion d'Honneur, and uh, I'm proud to call him, as well as the rest of the panelists, friends, and I'm, it's my privilege to have all of them here this morning. Um, by way of a brief uh, little introduction. Sorry, sorry, no, you do not. That's a surrealist gesture. <laughs> it's a throwaway gesture. Um, if uh, there are all these, there's a wonderful essay by a curator from uh, uh, MoMA in the little booklet talking about the trend forecasters, talking about surrealism is the coming trend. Getty Images, all these various people. Of course, we know that. We don't have to look very far to, to forecast this or say this. Um, those of us that read the New York Times, I just really literally came about across this uh, surrealism on TV show 
the rise of surreality on TV in the New York Times. And of course, um, everybody or everyone in my generation, and it seems that the younger generation also knows about Twin Peaks is coming back. Um, it's around in the fashion industry, Paris refashioned. And we've seen a spate of really important surrealist shows in the last year or two, the wonderful treachery of images Magritte show that Stephanie Barron did, the Magritte show in, uh, at the Pompidou, and Duchamp shows. And when you walk into the art fair here, we are greeted by a fabulous booth of Miro's on our left. Um, and, uh, and opposite them, as I say, is the Zwerner with the Ruth Asawa, uh biomorphic um, like sculptures in them. So I think it's all around us. I walked through the fair and I counted, I think, 25 booths that had things that I thought were surreal or surrealistic. Um, so I wanted to start by asking the panel to talk a little bit about the sort of intro to surrealism in America. And I thought we would concentrate on surrealism in America and the kind of ups and downs of surrealism in America. And this is going to be a conversation. And there are a lot of people in the audience who know a lot. So if you feel like saying something, do so. Um, Charlie, you want to start? Does this work? Yes. Um, well, surrealism came to America uh, almost right away, uh, but certainly by the early 30s, although it, I don't think it really got rolling until Prohibition was repealed. Um, it, it seems to me that um, the American art scene was, was badly depleted during the 20s because, can I, is that, is that better? Yeah, yeah, so I, I, I would think that um, uh, it came and it, and it stayed ever, ever since. Uh, as you know, the, the, the self-appointed founder of Surrealism, André Breton, uh, saw his role as not only aesthetic, but largely political, and that as a, you, you, as a, as a thinker, he hoped to spread Surrealism and start cells in as many countries as he possibly could. So there was a, it, it wasn't as if Americans necessarily wanted Surrealism, but you, you know, there was a push to expand it. Francis? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you made the point earlier, uh, well, before this began, that there was a real break between abstract art and surrealism. Uh, and that, that came to a head in America in the mid-1930s uh, when Alfred Barr was organizing the surrealism and the, the show called abstract, no, what was it called? Surrealism and uh, fantastic art data and surrealism it was in 1936. The American painters got wind of it and they protested uh, at the Museum of Modern Art and insisted that they get their uh, fair shake and he organized in the same year, a uh, few people seemed to put that together. Also in 1936, he did abstract, uh, cubism and abstract art. Uh, they both opened right back to back. So we were quite aware of the distinction between the two. Uh, though the surrealists were capable of fusing those two elements, especially Miro and Arp, uh, who could fuse a surrealist aesthetic with abstraction. But in America, they were thought of differently because when you see and understand something from a distance, you only seem to understand the tip of the iceberg. You don't get very deep in it, and we didn't. Uh, and we maintained that separation. Uh, more than the surrealists them, themselves did, I think. I was just going to say that the show that um, Francis mentioned, the, the moment 36, was um, actually the, the fantastic art was really historical. It was from Bosch through the ages, and it was really trying to find the precursors of surrealism. So already they were trying to make links to the past, and it was, I mean, quite must have been quite bizarre to see 15th century through 20th century, what we call old master paintings at MoMA in relation to Dada and Surrealism. So that was already very early looking back in trying to contextualize. Uh, 
they put in not only uh, precursors, but they also displayed children's art on the wall, which caused Sorry. some lenders to withdraw their work from the show, like Catherine Dreyer. Uh, they didn't want them, they, that was going too far. But with every movement, any art movement that has a name, something existed before it, because it needed to. Like even for cubism, you needed to have the cubist pictures that come up with the word. So you, something always came before. But with surrealism, it's true. You can't trace cubism farther back than early Brock and Picasso. But if you take, it depends on how you want to define the word surrealism. You can go back to cave art if you want. And that's part of the problem, uh, as I see it. The word surrealism is not properly defined in the minds of the people who use it. It's more abused than used. I hear it nearly every single night on the evening news. Anything that goes beyond reality is called surreal. So, but in, like you said, maybe that's good, but who cares really? I mean, well, there's, it seems like there are three. I mean, there's the, the misnomer of surrealism, surrealistic, which can mean phantasmagoric, imagistic, bizarre, um, things that are surreal. And then there's the literary visual movement, surrealism. I mean, I think what we're sort of talking about is how both the fat, not, not both, all the fashion industry, the uh, the television ads, uh, the film industry, as well as art, has been really infused with surrealism in so many ways over the past uh, 40, 50 years, and that now it's a time when we particularly see that which is surreal or surrealistic, and we see it both artistically in sort of abstract ways and also in imagistic ways. I mean, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that actually really began in the 40s through the kind of use of Dali's imagery in advertising fashion and Dali's influence on Walt Disney, who was, you know, an important carrier of popular imagery and, and surrealistic imagery. I, I think the, the over, there's a certain overexposure of surrealism in, in the media in terms of when you think of the CBS logo of the eye, you know, that was, that was in the 50s. I mean, uh, that's cool. Um, I think Dali and Magritte are the two artists that kind of impose their mark on the media and um, what the public perceives as being surreal or surrealistic. And I think it's, it's a movement that's so much richer than just those, the, the dichotomy between elements or those juxtapositions of things that shouldn't go together or it's, it's a movement full of uh, poetry and philosophy, and, and I think you don't always uh, realize that through the media. I mean, the media, I think, exploits certain traits of surrealism, and which I don't think is representative of the whole movement. Well, I think one of the most interesting connections, which we've, we've heard a lot about in the last few years, is the one between surrealism and pop art and Jasper Johns, Rauschenberg, that kind of thing. Well, I, I mean, we were talking earlier about important shows over the years from the Alfred Barr, the Chick Austin, the, the Art of Assemblage at MoMA in 1962, but then the, the, the show at Sidney Janis, um, The New Realism, really showed the relationship between nouveau realism in Europe and pop art in America, new imagery, but behind all of that, you had the influence of surrealism. So it was, in fact, um, that show, and the first show of surrealism that Chick Austin did, I think it was called the new super realism, before it was even called surrealism. So that pop art, and you know, there's so many artists who, like, uh, Rosenquist, who's using disparate imagery, which is coming out of popular advertising billboards, which is also in itself coming out of surrealism. But I think that show at Janus in 62 was, was kind of a 
reappraisal of surrealism through pop art? Um, I think one of the things that's interesting is in America, surrealism is it, it, it has been vilified periodically. And I think when we were at graduate school, when I was at graduate school, I remember being completely um, sort of crushed by the um, sort of sort of dislike, literally, of surrealism by a lot of academics. Um, Clement Greenberg, you know, launched a sort of campaign against it. And in the 70s, it was considered something that was sort of associated with, you know, Dolly being at Studio 54 and, um, and kind of uh, degenerate. It's, it's, it's true that there, there, there was a, a real sort of America first effort in, during, starting in the World War II years when so many of the European artists had to flee here to save themselves. There, there was uh, a tendency to argue on behalf of what <coughs> American paintings, painters were, were doing in an unprecedented way and to distinguish it from the Europeans and to, to, you know, to start afresh, even though the situation w was totally fluid and um, there, there was an, an, an enormous am amount of give and take and co cooperation. But uh, as you know, there's, a, there, there's um, the critical literature, ev even as, as it happens, it, it is, it is always at, a, at some kind of distance from what's happening. Um, so, yeah, I, I, when I went to school, I don't think, you, you know, you, nobody would mention Salvador Dali. I mean, he, he became a favorite of mine simply because I knew I could irritate anybody by saying Salvador Dali for, for, for most of my life. Um, and, and, it, and, it's, and it's really rather ast astonishing to think of historically that, that we did this to ourselves because there's several generations of Americans who didn't get to enjoy surrealism fully enough, I don't think. Um, and, es and especially poor Dali. I mean, he was so, and has been, so denigrated. I was, I was thrilled at this particular fair, finally to see a couple of works by Dali included in booths. But you, usually, you know, it, 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 if you can go to some enormous fair and not see a Dali, and, and yet, you know, he, he has to be one of a handful of the most important artists of, of the century, and yet he's been blackballed. And furthermore, he, if, you, if you wanted to play a game of precedent, you know, who was the first one to do this and that, uh, pretty much our entire artistic culture, starting with Warhol, is a, is a, is a wholesale reinvestment in Dali's ideas and performance and you know, and, and not being co compelled for some sense of ethics to avoid, you, you know, dabbling in advertising or on television. I mean, he opened the doors, everybody went through them, and then they shut him and left him out. Um, David, I, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Hence the friendship between Warhol and Dali. Yeah, I think actually I saw, I don't remember, I'm sad to say, the booth, but the Warhol painting that belonged to Dali is at this fair. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. And, and I was just going to add that it's, it's a little unfair to the fair to say that Dolly isn't in here. Give me a great Dolly. I'd love to put it in my booth and sell it. <laughs> we, they're too hard to get. They're too expensive. That's, I mean, you can criticize museums for not having them on the wall, but not this place. And yet the most popular museum shows will always yeah. be Dolly and then maybe Magritte. Absolutely. Dali, I've tried to do a Dali show. I mean, trying to get a Dali painting out of a museum, getting it off their wall, you know, they, you're awesome. told every time, this is one of our most popular pa paintings, you know, we, we can't let it go. I mean, they'll let go of something else, but Dali draws the crowds in, which is quite amazing. I mean, yeah, Chelychev was the most popular artist in the Museum of Modern Art when I was there in the 70s. And that painting, and I always can judge what the most popular painting is by going to the person who stocks the postcards and ask them how many, <laughs> who do you keep restocking? And it was Andrew Wyeth's Christina's World and, and the Chelychev. And, but now they've taken it off display. So 
When I was teaching at Columbia, I used to assign students to go to the Museum of Modern Art. And finally, I got so tired of <clears throat> papers on Christina's World that I said, you can do any picture except the Chelichev and Christina's World. <laughs> Um, I, I think we should talk a little bit about what David mentioned, which was Disney, the sort of connection between Disney and surrealism, and where you see that now in our current cultural kind of landscape. Um, and well, and I mean, artists, like I mean, Lynn Folks. Lynn Folks, well, I mean, in a way, Jeff Koons was sort of the Dali Disney of his time in the 40s. Um, Francis mentions Lynn, Lynn Falks. We have a show at the gallery that just opened of a older um, mid 80s painter who's sort of a both insider and outsider named Lynn Falks, who um, deals with, uh, he was in Helter Skelter. He's been kind of rediscovered every 10 years and still painting and we have a historical exhibition of, of work that is, you know, very political imagery, but a lot of references to Disney. Um, his first wife was, was married, his first wife's father was Disney's main animator. And um, he was attracted to Disney imagery. Of course, Disneyland was being built as he, in the late 50s in Los Angeles. And once he understood though, the manipulative powers of Disney through the Disney Club and how they try to indoctrinate kids and spread this message in a slightly sinister way. He, he, he began a body of work that just virulently tax Disney, skewers him literally in these paintings. Um, Disney's an ongoing character in, in his work. He's an artist, you know, there are paintings in the show that make clear references to Dali and also especially Magritte. I wouldn't call him a surrealistic painter, but he, he talks about how, and I think this is true for a lot of artists, the, particularly artists who don't grow up in, say, New York City or in big metropolitan areas with museums, their first initiation to art is through surrealism. They see reproductions of whether it's Dali or, uh, you know, even to Kiriko, who's sort of the founder of surrealism, even though he didn't want to be a part of it. Um, and it was through this exposure to Dali that Lynn Falks kind of became an artist. And, you know, many artists passed through that, and in his case, he kind of kept going back to it. So, in interesting figure. Jeff Kuhn says the same thing, that his parents got him a book about Dali, and that was, you know, his, his first memory. <laughs> I don't know if the audience is aware of how far Dali got into the film industry in Hollywood in the 40s, because both he and Man Ray came over at the same time in 1940, and they both headed right to Hollywood, and one of the main reasons was to tap into the film industry. Uh, Man Ray got not that far, because uh, it actually doesn't work for an artist who's open-minded and wants to paint whatever he wants, and then the film industry, of course, demands that you collaborate and you you get along with other people, which uh, it, it doesn't, didn't work. Uh, but Dolly got pretty far. Dolly, uh, you know, there, we do know that three of his pictures are in the background of the three Caballeros, for example, but that's about as, as far as Disney took him. Right. But he did the, what was that, in uh, Spellbound, he did the nightmare right. scene, and right. that, that's still well, he, a he classic. Well, he adored the Marx Brothers, especially Harpo, yeah. and, I, and made a special trip to Los Angeles and I think 1937 to meet them. I, re I remember that, you know, when, when I was at the Art Institute in Chicago, one of the things I, I, I most dreamed about being able to add to the collection was a, a harp, the strings of which were made with barbed wire that he had sent in advance as a gift to Harpo, who, who posed for the newspapers playing it with like band-aids on his fingers. And so, you know, I got in touch with Harpo's widow and asked, you know, what, whatever happened to the, the harp? And she said, oh, as soon as Dali left town, he threw it out. Well, you know, you couldn't use it. Uh, it was just taking up space. Um, I, uh, I think we should now sort of talk a little bit about where we see surrealism all around us uh, and in different forms. Um, 
and, uh, and um, Emmanuel, maybe you should start. Why, uh, why are you doing the Surrealist Banquet now? Um, why am I doing the Surrealist Banquet now? Um, I think in this case it was environmental. I mean, I, when I saw the room, when we were assigned the room upstairs, I started to think, what am I going to do with this room, which has a moose head and a stag's head and this chimney? I mean, just panel, paneling it white and putting a few paintings in there didn't seem right. So I started to think what would look right in this space and made me think of a great banquet hall or dining. It would be great to have a dinner in here. It would be, would be pretty fun to have a dinner in here. And I started thinking, what about putting a table in the middle and objects on there and just have like designing a cabinet curiosité, like the, a surrealist cabinet curiosité with everything related to food or flowers or all the pleasures of life. So I just just had fun and put together a serious banquet. This is not the serious banquet. It's just um, an idea, a few works that I've thrown together that uh, actually do work do work together. And I think one of the the common thread and one one of the reasons why I love surrealism so much is I think there is a certain amount of humor. In, in the art, and I think there's a lot darker version of surrealism, but I think there is, there is humor in the art, and I think you, it's important to look at surrealism like that also. Um, I, I think the, the sort of both sinister, I, iron, ironic, that aspect of it is certainly part, I think, of our zeitgeist right now. And I know you spend time talking to younger artists and you've mixed younger art with, with um, uh, surrealism. What do, we, what do we think? Do we think our zeitgeist has in common with the sort of zeitgeist of when surrealism started? Me? <laughs> no, all right. Well, I think it's a natural thing for artists to, artists to think in these terms because the real world is not acceptable. It, it's just, it's either too boring or it's terrible and you don't want to think about it. So you invent a new reality, something that really does go beyond it, uh, that maybe uses it as, as a basis and continues. Um, I don't think it'll ever go away. And it's, it, it's also, I, I mentioned this to you the other day, it, it, I became very aware of it in the 1980s with MTV because there were music videos where the people just stood in the front and said, but then they got quickly boring and they needed to add something to it. And then all of a sudden you saw surrealism just burst onto the scene uh, coming out of seemingly nowhere, but it became more interesting. They, did, they had to kick it up a level just to keep people looking. And maybe that's what artists are doing uh, when they verge into surrealism. They want to they want to amplify whatever they've already been doing, but to a level that it continues to be interesting and attracts attention. Um, when I think when you say the the world is either too terrible or too boring, um, probably we think it's more on the too terrible side at this point. So, what are your thoughts about the? you know, the level of uncertainty and anxiety. I just have to say something. The world right now is absolutely surreal. <laughs> Every time that guy gets on TV and something spews out of his mouth, it's like I'm in fiction land here. I can't yeah, help I, it. I, I would say, you know, from, from the movie Caddyshack with Rodney Dangerfield playing Donald Trump, and then you have House of Cards, and then you have the Trump presidency, that's, that's not surrealism, but it's surreal. Well, there, there is a, a parallel, of course, the, the way there is between prohibition and, uh, you know, activity in the American art world with the uh, rise of, globally, of fascism in the 30s and the flowering of surrealism. So I, I suppose if one thinks that history repeats itself, we shouldn't be surprised that the same parallels are there now. But I, but I thought that um, Emmanuel really, you know, hit the, the um, nail on the head by, 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 by stressing humor. And um, be, because it seems to me that, that that was one of the stumbling blocks for, um, for an American audience. I, I think that when, that when 
you, you, when, when attention started to being paid to the surrealists by museums um, in this country, there was a sense that, wait a second, you know, art is not funny. It's a serious, it's a serious enterprise. And, um, and that taboo is something that, you know, we're, we're still trying to shake off. I mean, it's part of our, um, that kind of earnestness, I think, is part of our, our national problem. Yeah, the sort of Protestant ethic. Humor, yeah. humor and extreme imagination. Nation and is... Also not really working in a series. Every picture is different. Um, surrealism, maybe more than Dada, was a painting or painting-oriented, but there was no aesthetic... Um, conformity in any way. It seems to me there's a huge resurgence of the sort of art of assemblage, the sort of putting, juxtaposing. Uh, I just went to the Whitney Biennial, so I just wondered what you thought about that. And all those mannequins. Yeah. <laughs> Everywhere. Right. Yeah. I think the best assemblage is when, and which you find in surrealism is the for, I mean, the painting and the title. I mean, the la the adding the dimension of language to painting, I think, is quite important. And when Magritte would find those titles, mm -hmm. or uh, Man Ray would play with language, with the, the difference between the French and the having lived in being right. American, having li lived in France, playing with the words that he would find funny or right. strange or confusing, and I think. I think the dimension of language, I think, is the best juxtaposition and adds a dimension to, to the art, which I think may add a dif difficulty to understanding it. I think it's another stumbling block for Americans. I mean, that, that there is, you know, because the language is very often French. Yeah. Francis, you mentioned, like, the influence on today's generation. Um, you know, the, despite the humor, it was a kind of political movement um, in all of its seriousness to change the world, especially the literary component, surrealism. Whether the, 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 the younger generation or um, post-millennials want to change the world, we don't know that. But one connection I see is just, if you look at the layering of imagery, collage, we talked about assemblage, and in digital culture, at least my kids, teenagers, the incredible visual sophistication of, of overlapping imagery and um, superimposing imagery. And you talk about the MTV, which began in the early 80s, but it's just moving so much faster now digitally. And I don't, I don't know if that's coming out of surrealism, but collage was such an important component of that period. Seamless collage. Absolutely. I mean, it's... it's um... I suppose fundamentally the most important word in 20th century art. The other one would be automatism. I mean, collage was was something basically um, a, a cubist uh, heritage, let's say. But automatism, which is a surrealist heritage, and I, in my, I don't think in my lifetime I've ever seen either an exhibition or even an essay devoted to uh, automatism as a whole, despite how, how pervasive it is. I mean, there are sort of old, older exhibitions, but not newer ones. I was thinking of automatism and, and robots, and the artist who did the robots. Oh, uh, Jordan Wolfson. Okay, Jordan Wolfson. I don't know how many of you have seen the Whitney Biennial or saw the Jordan Wolfson, but that sort of idea of a very frightening robot is acting out impulses, that are dangerous is something that I think comes out of surrealism. Have you seen that, the oh, Jordan yes. Wolfson? Oh yes, oh, yeah. that, well, I, mannequins. What? Mannequins. Mannequins, mannequins. 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 right. I, mean, I think, you know, the, 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 the emphasis on objects in, in, in surrealism was, um, had such broad appeal to a public that wanted to be able to understand modern art, that, uh, and it's never gone away. I think, I think in the years to come, I think we see more and more like the, not, not only virtual reality, but enhanced reality, where you can 
the most popular website or apps are the ones that have that can add filters to what you look like or what you're looking at. And I think one day we'll walk through down the streets and be able to see super, I mean, you can already do that. I mean, superimpose on, um, on an object, explanations about that object or, so the, the whole, I think this different reality is so close to surrealism. I think there's this need for, to look for something else or look for uh, a richer experience of life. I mean, and I think surrealism, I think in a way can provide that. I mean, or as um, sown the seeds for that. If there is a future for surrealism, it might be just that, because as the phones get smaller and smaller, they're predicting they'll fit in your brain somewhere. And since I'm already using it as my memory aid, it'll be coming maybe just in time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in the audience now. Yeah, I was just going to say, would, I know, David, you're thinking, you're working on a show of surrealism, including a lot of contemporary artists. A few, yes, but um, we're working on this show very early stages with Nicholas Hall, an old master specialist, and very much looking at that MoMA show that I mentioned that Alfred Barr did, Fantastic Art Data Surrealism, so I'm going to be calling you and you momentarily. <laughs> but it will look, I mean, it will be probably, you know, 50% historical pictures. And, and when you look at that catalog, the selection of old master works was actually pretty mediocre. We're hoping to do a lot better. Um, passing through Dada and Surrealism, and then we'll engage a few contemporary artists to, to maybe look at such a big topic. Um, we, we might engage five or six contemporary painters to maybe look at a particular Bosch painting and um, make a work in relation to that. Otherwise, the show would be over a five-year period if we tried to be <laughs> historically accurate. And that'll be next year sometime. Um, all right, well, now it's your turn. Um, we want to know what you know or what you want to know, what you want to add or um, questions about what, what, uh, what you think the current sort of re, uh, re about, not re, just recurrence of surrealism in all the media that we see around us. Somebody has to have a question. There, thank heavens. John. When you're just talking about Bosch and surrealism, I see the obvious similarities, but in my total naivete, I had thought that surrealism had a, um, a, a mindset and, a, and a, a program that Bosch may seem to fit into, but since he obviously didn't have that mindset, is it really valid to, to uh, make these connections? between Bosch in, in the past and 20th century surrealism? I think so. I mean, it, it seems to me that they themselves did. Um, <clears throat> they, 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 they published magazines that would have spreads called, you know, the, my favorite poets and painters of the past that would include, uh, they wanted roots. I think, it, you, you know, that, that, that as modern art came into its own as a, at least as a museum subject, with the founding of the Museum of Modern Art and then uh, the Wadsworth Athenaeum competing with them. The, um, you, you know, the uh, idea was to show a public that these curious things that looked shocking, you know, you'd look at a Cubist Picasso and wonder what it was you were seeing, and they'd, they'd hang it next to a, an unfinished Cezanne or they'd hang it next to an African mask or, or, or have a room that would just sort of show in, in Darwinian fashion that, that what the contemporary artists were doing was, was, was novel, but it was rooted in tradition. And, and, I, and you make an important no, point I, there. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, obviously, the, the, the whole context, as you know well, is, is you can't compare the 15th century with 20th century in terms of patronage or artist's intention. But um, I think there's always this kind of desire to find antecedents and roots for things. And, Look at the Picasso and primitivism show, 
very easy to attack that, but you know, it was in the air. The artists were collecting that material, they were talking about it, and um, as you say, they had reproductions of these black and white reproductions, and you know, they saw works in European museums. So there, there's enough there to, mm -hmm. I think, make that point. So you can't really say that you know what Bach's mindset was. So you can't say he didn't have a mindset because he's uh, such a fabulous uh, a fantasist that you, uh, you have to leave it open that there are, may be valid connections between Bosch and some of the fantastic art of the 20th century. Kurt Seligman uh, gave a course at the New School years ago, which I took, and, and one of the, it was called Abstraction and Surrealism, the Ill-Matched Brothers. And he uh, was a wonderfully uh, uh, knowledgeable, uh, witty, urbane uh, uh, teacher. And his finest lectures were on Bosch, beautiful lectures on Bosch. And he uh, really understood and got into the, what uh, you could call uh, uh, the, uh, the surreal elements in uh, Bosch's uh, work. So, uh, uh, and as it was just said that uh, if the artist felt the connection, we have to accept that there was a real connection there. All right, come on, people. If you have no questions, we have no answers. Uh, Mr. David Leiva, you mentioned that um, in America, people only saw the tip of the iceberg and not what was laying deeper than that. Would you say that that's because uh, surrealism, surrealism proposes uh, the observer to have a different attitude in front of the art piece? Would that be fair to say that? Because at the time, it was a different uh, historical situation, a social situation than nowadays. And nowadays, we are facing surrealism, uh, like they mentioned in the media, constantly. And we are forced to uh, have a new attitude constantly uh, in front of the art pieces or the, or, or the media. And what I meant by that is that in America, American artists would get, as the tip of the iceberg, just the visuals. Um, <clears throat> since they are, after all, visual beings, they might not have known that, you know, that Breton was saying that, that Freud and the unconscious were where this imagery was supposed to be coming from. Uh, so they, they s approached it in a very different way. And that's the reason for the kind of disconnect between American surrealist painters and European painters. Uh, though, of course, that sort of changed when the surrealists physically came here and they became part of the community of artists in New York in the 40s. Uh, but more or less, the Americans saw only those little few examples and on the basis of those, invented their own style, a kind of visual style. And sometimes, I mean, some went deeper, of course, it's hard to generalize and say that as a blanket statement about all of them. But the same thing happened with cubism. They sort of got it wrong. They didn't really know what was going on. They were just getting those little visual cues and inventing their own form of cubism, which superficially looked like it, but was nothing like uh, as it was being produced even in Europe. But that's even true in Europe. I mean, the people looking at Picasso and Brock weren't doing real cubism either, not at least the ones that the pioneers were doing. So it's, there's always that kind of disconnect, but one that seems to increase with the 3,000 miles distance between America and Europe, and particularly then. Um, that may change now. That may not be a factor today because news is absolutely instantaneous and you get everything that somebody's thinking virtually. Uh, it doesn't matter where they live. So I, I'm not sure that can still occur now, or at least you can't blame it on that if we don't understand what's going on. Next. Um, one more question. I have a question. Um, when did you get 
do you consider yourself hooked on surrealism and when did you get hooked on surrealism and why? And are you still Charlie? Down the panel. Down the panel. Um, I studied in Philadelphia where they had the Arnsberg collection and the, uh, people were talking all the time about Lou Kahn and Marcel Duchamp, that was it. And, and then when I, when, I, when I got my first serious museum position in Chicago, I, 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 it was a city that was famous for collecting surrealism and, and I wanted to address that. So, um, and it's never left me. I mean, it's gotten worse and worse. Uh, I guess in my case, really just visiting um, museums, I went to Yale and having that exposure to the art gallery and the, especially the Societe Anonyme collection that Catherine Dreyer formed with, with Duchamp's help. That's one of the great collections which also, you know, she was able, especially through an artist like Max Ernst, see and include abstraction, non-objective abstraction with surrealism. And then uh, really I think the visits to particular museums like the Peggy Guggenheim collection, trips to Italy, um, obviously the Menil, and, um, and then moving to New York and having the bounty at MoMA. And so it, it never left me. I mean, it's, it's always, I've always been enchanted. So it's not been cyclical. I never got hooked on surrealism. <laughs> Uh, it was Dada and Duchamp, and I, it's, uh, it, and I can't get out of it. I'm stuck with that. It, it's, I tell everyone that Duchamp said that art was a habit-forming drug, and in turn, I have to confess to everyone that for me, Duchamp is heroin, and I can't get off it, and I'll never get off. So I'm not there. Um, I was personally fascinated by abstract art. Um, Kandinsky was one of the, the artists that I most revered. And I wrote my thesis at the Quartal on Kandinsky and the year 1937, where it's, it's like a transition year, a year where so many things happen in terms of the Universal Exhibition in Paris and how Kandinsky tries as an abstract artist from different nationality, having lived in Russia, G uh, Germany, and France, how he fits into that and how surrealism at that period pervades his abstraction with the biomorphism. And then I went to Sotheby's and I started working on the Man Ray estate and I discovered uh, this whole world of fantastic art, you know, I mean, something that was fun about language, about humor, about objects. And I fell in love with surrealism then and started looking into it and trying to learn as much as I could. Great. Well, thank you all very much, and I hope you have a great time visiting the fair, and thanks for coming. Thank you, Francis. And I'll second that. Thank you for coming. I think this has been a fantastic conversation, and I thank you all for the depth of your knowledge and expertise, wit and charm that you all brought to this wonderful conversation in the best surrealistic way. Um, I hope you will visit the fair and I hope you will come back tomorrow morning for our conversation on art, fashion and performance, creating magic. Um, we also, I must say to you, have to vacate the room quite quickly because it turns into a restaurant now for lunch. So thank you again. Thanks to all of you. Bye-bye.